Sure. Yep. No problem. All sorted? No, no, you're all, yeah, it's all right. And just, I know that there's wind, sound and so on, so if you have any problems with sound, just I'm happy to repeat things or talk louder or anything like that if, if that makes, uh, if, if you need that. Well, tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mahi nui kia koutou, um, and good morning. Uh, look, we're here down at Ofero Bay again, which is where we uh, came when we launched the consultation on the National Adaptation Plan. Uh, and this is as you can see, one of the more exposed communities in the Wellington region in terms of the effects of sea level rise, particularly in terms of the impacts that that has on um, storms and flood damage when you get king, uh, king tides and storms combined. Uh, and over here behind us, you know, you can see uh, the sea wall that's been rebuilt that holds up the road. And, and you know, what we're going to see is more of a need for this kind of activity uh, all around uh, coastal regions of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, over the course of the last year or so, there have been New Zealanders all over the country ha who have experienced firsthand the increasing impact of climate change in their communities. So people are now experiencing, with increasing severity and increasing frequency, the floods, the droughts and the storms that are associated with a changing climate. Now, th sorry, that's just wind, that's, you know. <laughs> uh, as, as we know, um, the best solution is of course to stop putting pollution up into the atmosphere that causes climate change in the first place. And if we can do that, uh, then that will mean that the climate crisis doesn't get much worse than it already is. But over the course of the last century or so, global temperatures have risen already by about one degree. And so we are already experiencing a change in climate and that is already having an impact uh, on weather patterns which lead to those uh, droughts and storms and floods that we're experiencing uh, more and more at the moment. So in order to stop putting the pollution up into the atmosphere in the first place, that is the role of the uh, emissions reduction plan that we launched in May alongside the budget. Uh, and um, uh, having said that, we actually do need to adapt to the effects of climate change that are already happening. And that is the role of the National Adaptation Plan that we're publishing today. Now we have known about climate change for more than three decades. Uh, and you know, during the course of that time, there were plenty of opportunities for us to start to take action on climate change uh, and on adapting to the effects of climate change. And to tell you the honest truth, we did not take up that opportunity as a country or frankly as a planet. What that means is that we are now in a situation where we're having to do more work all at once in order to, uh, in order to get started. We've never had a national adaptation plan before, and as of today, we do. Uh, but, we, you know, it is going to take a, a little while for us to kind of gear up because we're starting from uh, quite a low base. Two years ago, we published a, a climate change risk assessment, the first comprehensive risk assessment in the country. Uh, and what that identified was 43 priority risks, uh, which does seem like rather a lot of priorities. Uh, and so what this first adaptation plan does is it tries to put in place a framework to start to deal with all of those risks to some extent or another. Um, but we are going to have to start by laying the foundations for a more comprehensive program over a much longer period of time than just the, the period of time that this risk assessment covers, which is six years. Um, that will obviously be followed by a second uh, risk assessment in a few years time and then another adaptation plan after that. So uh, it is going to be a long haul. There is a lot of work to do as a country, not just to reduce our emissions and to help to stop to make the climate crisis from getting any worse, but also to put in place a more resilient um, um, uh, country and more resilient communities. The upside is that if we do this work, 
uh, then I think people will notice that their communities are more resilient to the kinds of floods and droughts and fires and so on that we're experiencing. And the kinds of costs that are already being layered on communities and onto property owners and onto insurance companies and onto local authorities, that that can actually start to go down rather than to go up. Because if we continue not to take comprehensive action, those costs will continue to accelerate. So the intention of the plan is to try and get ahead of that uh, and to make sure that we're building in the right place uh, and where we've got communities like the one that we're standing in at the moment, that they've got the tools that they need to be able to adapt to the effects of climate change that are already locked in. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, in very rough terms, uh, around the coastal areas of New Zealand, we think that there is something on the order of 70,000 houses. Now, that's just coastal areas. We don't have quite as good data on um, uh, you know, uh, river floodplains and so on. And actually, it's um, f flood risk uh, in our kind of alluvial uh, areas that is actually more present uh, than even than kind of coastal coastal hazard guidance, so it's a significant number, obviously, uh, and and it's not confined just to houses, right? There are kind of farms, there's commercial uh, property, there's um, public infrastructure, whether that's owned by local authorities or by central government. So it's you know it's a significant risk that we're facing. So the, there's not going to be a single pot. Uh, you know, what we're talking about here is um, an, there will be a number of financing tools to deal with different parts of the problem. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, the Minister for EQC, the Honourable David Clark, is currently working through um, flood insurance issues. So we are seeing some real tensions, you know, over the course of the last year, repeated flood events uh, and associated insurance claims in, uh, in a number of areas like Tairawhiti or, or Westport and so on. And so we're trying to develop a solution to deal with that as the, as the kind of most immediate challenge that we have uh, as a country. We'll take lessons from that and then start to apply it to other parts of the challenge, whether that's coastal or drought uh, risk and so on. Um, we also know that emergency costs are increasing and so you know we are putting more resource into our uh, civil defence and emergency management uh, system and so on. So I just, I, I just kind of, um, there's no kind of one tool that we'll be using but there will be a range of tools that, that we use to do this. Yes. Look, the government has taken a hardship lens to this. So, you know, we've been very clear that the orientation of our adaptation work program has to be supporting people who do not have the resource to be able to kind of deal with those uh, challenges themselves. Um, and there are lots of them, right? And, and those communities are very different. I mean, if you look at, you know, the situation in Westport versus South Dunedin versus Tairawhiti versus Northland, you know, these are communities that are very different, not just in terms of their kind of socioeconomic circumstances, but the, the kind of type and geography of, of the places, the nature of the construction that they've got. So, you know, we, we do want to make sure that we're building something that kind of works for individual communities. Well, I mean, first of all, we need to make sure that we're building in the right place in the future. And whilst we did issue guidance in 2017, you know, that's been unevenly applied. And so one of the things in the adaptation plan is that we're going to become more directive uh, about where we're able to, uh, to build in the future. Having said that, as we know, we've already got developments in a number of places that are increasingly at risk. We've been very clear that the, um, the risk and the cost has to be appropriately shared between the property owner their insurance company, their bank, local government and central government. Uh, and, and like I said, we're taking a hardship approach here that, we, that we've said that we will not cover every loss and we cannot cover every loss uh, in, in the country. That's, that's as plain as day when you, when you look at the numbers. So we have to, I think, work to support those communities uh, that, are, that are going to be really struggling to be able to adapt um, given, this, given their circumstances. Well, 
Well, uh, yes, yeah, so the climate change adaptation bill that we're going to be introducing into the House next year uh, will be addressing at least part of that funding challenge. So we've said that there, ha there clearly has to be some new institutional arrangements there, including ones relating to funding and financing. Uh, later this year, we'll be publishing the work programme so that people can kind of see the different bits of the jigsaw puzzle. Because, like I said, there's no one tool that we're going to be uh, that we're going to be using here. Is there an estimated cost currently of, of total estimated managed retreat? No, there isn't. And I, I also just want to be clear that managed retreat is only one of the options. You know, there are different options that communities uh, can have. I mean, I, I have said in some cases, doing nothing may be an option. Uh, it's, I mean, there are obviously costs and um, consequences that are associated with that. Accommodating the changes, which you know may involve uh, raising houses up above their current level, and that is actually already being done in some parts of the country, like around Edgecombe, where we had those floods a few years ago. Those many of those houses have actually been lifted up and, and placed on pads or stilts and so on uh, in some of those areas. Um, defending from it, and you know here you can see you know you've got flood defences being being put in place through the use of sea walls and so on. That's an option. And then also you do have uh, the option of managed retreat. And all of those uh, have some costs and all of those have some consequences. What we want to make sure is that communities have really good information available to them about those different options and that they're able to choose the one that makes the most sense for themselves. Um, well, no, because that's going to be really different in different parts of the community. I mean, if you can imagine, uh, you know, for example, well, I mean, you know, if you look at Westport, for example, you know, you've got a, a sort of a, um, a you know, a, a central business district area and a port area that's obviously been exposed to, you know, um, significant risk. That's quite different from a strip of houses in a coastal area, um, you know, which, um, you know, m might have sort of 20 houses or something like that. So it's, it's hugely varying around the country, and that's why the emphasis really has to be on empowering communities and local authorities to be able to map, map out the risks and, and determine those options. Um, the work program, I mean, there, there's a prioritisation uh, kind of challenge within government and obviously, um, you know, having the COVID challenge has put a lot of pressure on the public service. Um, but also, frankly, it is an astonishingly complex area of public policy to work through. Uh, and so, you know, we've prioritised um, getting the plan out, being able to send that kind of signalling. Uh, and at the same time, we've been gathering information which will then inform that legislation next year. government uh, that is part of this plan. So for example, the work that David Park is leading on the resource management system reform is a huge part of this program because ultimately uh, adaptation is to a large extent a, a planning function and the resource management reform is a total overhaul of our planning system. So what we wanted to do through this plan is to kind of highlight that, to draw those things in, to show how all of that fits together. Um, there are also some things that are currently in train uh, as well and, and there are some other areas of policy where it made final policy decisions. You have to remember this is also a plan for the next six years. Um, so tools that we'll be putting in place over that six year period. No, there, no, there, there are definitely um, you know, quite a number of new actions uh, in this. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, Treasury next year um, will be publishing uh, for the first time an assessment of the total cost, to your question, uh, of uh, climate change uh, on not just the government's books but on to the economy as a whole. So in the um, economic uh, fiscal update that we've done in the last couple of years there has been some work done on referencing those kinds of costs over time or those projections for costs over time to the country but there's never been a comprehensive focused report on that so there, that's, that's new, they'll be doing that. Um, we've also uh, said that we're going to be publishing 
um, uh, uh, public uh, data and information for communities about things like sea level rise, the, um, some of the projections for um, what, uh, you know, you would have seen the NZ Sea Rise project a few weeks ago, some of the underlying data we're going to, be, you know, make that more publicly available so people have got access to it and so on. So there are a number of things that we have made, actually some of which have, as a result of the consultation, uh, where we said, well, let's bring that, bring that forward. And yes, there are also some work programs that we're going to get started on, but which will mature over time. Well, I think the fact that we have a plan, and we've never had one before, the fact that we actually do have our public agencies now working on this and saying, look, this is a real risk and, the, and we do need to, uh, to get ahead of it. You know, there are um, communities that are already experiencing these, uh, these effects, obviously, and, you know, we are putting more resource into our emergency management and response programme, and you can see that in this plan as well. So that support is already there, and we are scaling that up. Um, and having said that, you know, what we actually do have time uh, to be able to start this process because, you know, whilst, whilst these risks are in front of us, they're not all going to occur all at once everywhere in the country. So we can say, look, how we, how we resolve this is by having good planning, is by putting in place uh, those good decision-making frameworks, is by working out funding and financing mechanisms to help people to adapt, because it isn't all going to happen tomorrow. But for people who are experiencing those effects today, that support is, all, is available. So the, I mean, final detail on that hasn't yet gone through uh, cabinet. So uh, I can sort of only answer part of that question. But you know, up until now, we have had a bit of a haphazard approach where councils have, in different parts of the country, tried to do different things. Most of them haven't been terribly successful. So what we've said is we need to be able to backstop those local authorities in order to enable them to do the right thing, and to be able to make that information available to property owners. Well, my, oh, sorry, Michael, I, I mean, as I said before, I am frustrated that for the last three decades, successive governments have not paid any attention in any real form to the challenges that we face from the effects of climate change. And so, you know, we had to start somewhere, uh, and I'm not satisfied that the, you know, that those kind of lost decades uh, have left us in a very good position because, you know, as I already said, th those communities are already experiencing these uh, effects on an increasing scale, you know, both severity and, and frequency. Uh, and that is tremendously frustrating, you know, because if we had started earlier, it would have cost us less and many of those communities would already have, you know, whether it's seawalls or if they'd started the process of, you know, adapting to those effects, you know, they would already be in a much more resilient position. Look, I am the first person to say how frustrated I am at the incredibly slow pace uh, that of government in responding to the climate crisis. Uh, and so, you know, th I think that is that is tremendously frustrating. But we've, you know, now that we've actually got a statutory plan in place, I think that you will see the momentum pick up. Uh, one of the things about this plan and the emissions reduction plan that we released the other day is it's not static. So it's not, you know, this, by the time we get to the next plan, this plan will have changed quite a lot. We are trying to put in place a system for being able to, uh, quite a dynamic system for being able to adjust to circumstances as they emerge and to put in place accountability mechanisms in government that we've never had before. So I think with that, I do have confidence that we are going to be able to respond to those, but I do share people's frustration that it has taken us a very long time to get started as a country. Yes. Some to rivers and but I could see anything really about those other 
Yeah, so in, in the assessment that we did two years ago, it did point towards um, a, a number of risks uh, over time, and they include not just the kind of obvious ones of coastal and, and river plain, but also um, flood risk, fire risk, and also risk to health, uh, changes in disease vectors, um, and uh, food production, uh, access to um, fresh water, and so on. And so this plan is designed to start laying the foundations for a response to all of those risks, but some of those risks are crystallising faster than others. Uh, and particularly in our uh, river plains where we do have a number of settlements and cities around the country, you know, we know that those communities are feeling those effects more rapidly. Having said that, you know, you talk to any farmer in the country, they will tell you that there is an increase in the drought season, that the severity of those droughts is increasing and the frequency of those droughts is increasing as well. And that is also having a tremendous impact on, on our farming systems. So we, we do need to take, I think, a comprehensive view of it. You know, just a wee bit ahead of me on that one. Um, so, uh, you know, I I, I'm not in a position to kind of release the kind of technical details of that, um, but it is based largely on uh, information that we already have in some of our public institutions like NIWA, for example, um, and, you know, we're kind of changing the model to really try and make that much more open source, much more accessible to people than it has been in the past. There will be a number of tranches to it, so, you know, we're obviously just going to start with the information that we have, but we also know that there are gaps in our data, there are gaps in our, in our projections, um, and we're going to be filling those in over the course of the next few years as well. Yes. You would have thought. They, so they literally, I mean, are they the only two who haven't and everyone else is? No. Why, why no. no well, that, this is what I was saying to Michael. It, it's incredibly frustrating to me that, it, that you know, the institution of government uh, has, has not grasped the scale and the severity of the impact of climate change. I mean, we've sort of known it intellectually for decades uh, that this has been coming. And yet we haven't taken those decades as a country to try and get ahead of it. And we are now in a situation where we're having to clean up repeated messes in different parts of the country and also to try and get ahead of, uh, you know, it get, uh, of it getting any worse. Uh, my sense is that it is uh, certainly on the agenda in ways that it never was before we got into government and started to bring this work programme into place. What yes. Sort of, um, yeah. Look, I, I have tremendous kind of empathy for uh, local councils around the country, especially those in our kind of more remote um, uh, places with very low uh, uh, rating bases. Um, the uh, local government review that Nanaya Mahuta is currently leading is considering the uh, costs of climate change and the role that local government will have. Uh, and it is uh, really significant. I mean, actually, you know, local government will have a leading role uh, in working with their communities to adapt to the effects of climate change. It is significant. We're seeing changes already in the pattern of rainfall uh, and water availability in the country. So um, in some areas we're actually going to see more rainfall uh, and you know, some people are experiencing that a lot at the moment. Um, but then long periods with very little rainfall at all. And so the ability to manage that is one of the uh, impacts of climate change um, that, we're, that we're going to have to deal with. Um, the uh, work around three waters, um, the the, the kind of four big entities that are being um, put in place, they're actually going to have uh, legislated uh, requirements around taking adaptation measures into account um, because they will have a leading role in ensuring that people are able to access uh, fresh water when they need to. Green Party nominations closed tomorrow. Have you put your nomination in? I have. Are you aware of any other nominations? I'm not. Are you confident that you will get the pro leadership there? I am. Are you that 
you that there's enough sort of cross-parliamentary um, agreement that this is something we need to continue on and that your work won't be in vain? Well, look, I, I mean, my uh, conversations that I've had with uh, Scott Simpson, who's the National Party uh, spokesperson on climate change, is that he is very aware of the risks around uh, the effects of climate change on communities and is uh, uh, kind of conscious of how complex a, a policy area it is and definitely wants to um, kind of highlight that uh, if he is lucky enough to um, uh, be in a position to do something about it. So, I mean, these risks aren't going away, right? People are feeling these effects um, and members of parliament on both sides of the house are having to deal with constituents, uh, you know, who, who are who are kind of suffering as a result of the increasing storm damage or, or drought or, or whatever it is, uh, wherever they are in the country. When do you think we'll start to see managed retreat? Uh, um, it, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. And, and I think that if we um, put in place the right framework over the course of the next sort of 12 to 24 months or so, uh, that um, you will start to see decision-making processes occur that we haven't yet seen uh, and that that will then lead to um, you know communities making decisions about how, how to go about that. I know that there have been some councils uh, that have considered it already um, but don't necessarily have the kind of tools to be able to deal with it. Um, one of the things that we wanted to emphasise through this plan is uh, when we passed the Urban Development Authority's uh, legislation in our first term that was in part to give uh, uh, local communities an option for how to uh, how to go about those kinds of uh, challenges if they if they wanted to use that. Um, but you know this is a, a a kind of a community conversation that needs to be had, um, and at the moment there's no good process available to people that then leads to a satisfactory outcome. And so that that is one of the most important things that we can do in the short term. Communities need to be able to m make these decisions. They need to be empowered to be able to um, uh, to make these decisions. Now, they they won't be on their own. I mean, one of the most important roles that central government can have is to make sure that they have the resources uh, available to them, and that that is kind of you know on us to make sure that we can do that over the course of uh, of the coming uh, year or so. But having said that, you know, their local authority conversations with their um, financing institutions, banks and insurers is also a really important part of the equation. G'day. No, I think, you, you, well first of all you'd need to talk to David Clark about that because he is the minister who's leading that work. Um, uh, you know, we are, are aware that there is a transition that needs to take place from where we are today to where we need to be in, in the future because we do have, you know, community spots and, and we've seen the insurance in that essentially the risk is increasing to a point that something may become uninsurable or very, very expensive to insure on the current basis. So Cabinet hasn't made any final decisions about what, uh, what that's going to look like. One of the things we're very conscious of, and there are lessons from all over the world, is about uh, you know, what are some of the unintended consequences uh, of decisions that we make around that. So we're, we're wanting to make sure that uh, people have got the support that they need when they need it, and at the same time that we don't want to encourage people to put new developments into areas uh, which actually just don't make sense. Okay, that seems like everything. Great, thanks very much.